It is 5.15 p.m. and with this it's time for the ETH Colloquium. A very warm welcome to the audience attending and on screens and of course to our guest today, Jan Dirk Wegner. My name is Raymond Grenacho and with me from the organization committee is Christiane Sibylle. Well, um, no doubt we live in an era where our planet is facing increasingly complex environmental challenges and as conventional uh, research methods mostly fail to provide comprehensive insights on the global level, new solutions are required to understand and to monitor uh, nature on a such large scale. A very promising approach is the fusion of uh, deep learning technologies with satellite data. And at today's colloquium, Jan Dirk Wegner uh, will share a glance to this new frontier of environmental monitoring by introducing his ongoing research. As the chair of uh, Data Science for Sciences at the University of Zurich, and as head of EcoVision Lab at ETH. Um, he, Jan has dedicated his career to harnessing the power of data-driven approaches to tackle some of our most pressing environmental challenges. So we invite you to delve into the world of deep learning and its potential to address global environmental challenges in yeah, environmental and geosciences. So I'm very happy to hand over to Jan now uh, for the next 30 minutes and afterwards there will be plenty of time for uh, discussion and your questions and at the very end there's going to be an opera around the corner here. So yeah, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. So if you were planning on attending the inaugural lecture of Thomas Zurbuchen, you are wrong. <laughs> so that's an Audi Max. But I promise you, this will be an exciting talk as well. At least I'll try to make it exciting as I can. So um, I will present two projects that are ongoing in my group that should illustrate to you that with a combination of uh, satellite data with modern data science and deep learning in our case, that this is kind of a marriage in heaven. So those two together enable us to scale to very large scales and up to global scale to get homogeneous estimates for, for biomass or also for, for snow depth. So I have two projects. The first one I will present to you is a snow depth estimation across uh, Switzerland. And then the second one is um, global vegetation mapping, where we combine space-borne laser scanning data with satellite imagery. Let's start with the first one. So this is a project that was accomplished, um, funded by the Inno Swiss, and uh, together with this um, uh, spin-off of the University of Zurich called Exolabs, who have uh, fantastic colleagues that are working on remote sensing data and machine learning. And it was implemented by my postdoc, Rodrigo Cayetaut, um, who deserves the credit for this and who did all the work. So the goal of this is that we get very high spatial resolution snow depth maps um, covering the whole country of Switzerland at the temporal frequency of a, a weekly. Yeah? So every, every week we get one new snow depth map of Switzerland. And why is this interesting? Well, um, we need this for accurate planning of hydroelectric energy um, plants. Um, we need to also yeah, be aware of very strong melting events in the spring and so on, because if we know how, how, how deep the snow is, we can sort of also infer the snow water equivalent and, and so on and so forth. And, um, not least uh, for all of you who love skiing or snowboarding, this will also provide more accurate snow maps for ski touring and so on. Right. So, and, and the data that we are using is uh, very exciting and valuable data. This comes from this um, 
um, Sentinel uh, mission from the European Space Agency, where Switzerland is also a member. And this is exciting because there's many satellites uh, part of this, but the most commonly used are Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Sentinel-1 is a radar mission, a C-1 radar mission, so it's an active sensor. You can look through the clouds. It's a microwave sensing um, principle. And Sentinel-2 is an optical sensor, so it's basically a flying camera in space, but with many more bands than we have. So in our mobile phone, we have red, green, blue channels, the satellite has 13 channels that are tailored to analyze vegetation, uh, so-called near-infrared and infrared channels that can estimate, can be used for to estimate the, the state of the, the health of the vegetation or for yield prediction and so on and so forth. And uh, we also use a digital elevation model because um, then we can basically, the, the learning engine, our deep learning model, can better evaluate how the snow distributes in, in the in, across the altitudes. So this is a video now of the Sentinel-2 mission. So the Sentinel-2 mission consists of two satellites that are identical, and they follow each, follow each, other, each other on the, um, on, on the orbit, and they continuously scan the Earth. Yeah. And the images have a 10-meter ground sampling distance, so one pixel projected to the Earth's surface is 10 by 10 meters. And all imagery is publicly available for free. Uh, so this is something, it's a mission that has been paid by the taxpayer because it's viewed as public infrastructure like we would build highways or schools and so on. It's something that's in space, there for us, and is accessible publicly by, by, by basically globally, mm -hmm. uh, by everyone. And uh, this makes it a very valuable data source because um, we can access it for free in science, but also any product, any method that we developed can be used by, by everyone, basically, because the data is available. So it's not this very niche thing where we buy some super expensive data and in Central Euro Europe we can pay for it and we have it, and then we only can work with the software. This is not the case. Yeah? So it can be basically, if people have the computational resources and internet access, can be used by anyone. And uh, the second mission is uh, Sentinel-1, the SAR image looks a bit different. So this is Lake, Lake Geneva on the bottom right. Now it's flying here uh, north across Germany. It's Hamburg popping up very bright across Denmark. Um, on the bottom is North Sea, top is Baltic Sea. And now right in the middle where it's finishing, this bright spot is Oslo in Norway. And you already see it looks a bit different, sort of a grayscale image. Uh, so this is the, an amplitude radar image that we have, and uh, you also see the, the nice property is that we can look through the clouds. Uh, so if we at the same time look on top of the globe with the optical satellite, the Sentinel-2 that I showed to you before, you would only see the clouds, so that wouldn't be very helpful for either vegetation monitoring or snow depth, but with a radar sensor you can look through the clouds. Uh, you are independent of cloud coverage and also robust against rain and so on. And the nice thing about these sensors is so they are in orbit um, more or less since 2016. And the Sentinel-1 mission also has a revisit, has also two satellites, and both missions have a revisit cycle. So three to five days for Sentinel-2, um, and for this Sentinel-1, uh, six days. So unfortunately, one of the two broke. <laughs> so, and since we no longer have access to Soyuz, the Russian capacity, we still have to wait for the second satellite now to be put into space. So at the moment, we have a re revisit cycle of 12 days. That it means every point on Earth is photographed every 12 days with this, and every three to five days with the optical satellite. And all these images go into an archive, so we can also now go back to 2016 and look, okay, who, I don't know, deforested illegally in the Amazon in 2017. So it's an archive, it's a continuous archive that is monitoring our Earth. And we can always look back. Yeah. So, and what we now do, so the method is that we use both this optical and the SAR, synthetic aperture radar images, and we combine them together, and then we overlay them to this digital elevation model of Switzerland, and then um, we feed this to a deep learning engine. In our case, we use a so-called convolutional GRU, gated recurrent unit. So what does this do? Well, this is an, 
an, a nice deep learning approach for time series modeling. There's also other models, so transformers are all the hype. We also work with those, and there's then, there are many new cool ideas. Uh, this interesting bit is that this convolutional GIU allows us to look at patterns of snow cover or biomass in the image, so look at texture in the image, and then the time series component, yeah, so this gated recurrent unit and the, the recurrent neural network that we are using allows us to also track patterns over time, so some certain change of a pattern, yeah, how it changes. So we have two types of evidence in the for in each and every image, we look at the texture in the image, and then how that texture changes over time. And we get this input every, every week once for the whole country. And then um, we also have a probabilistic calibration of the model, so we do not only predict the snow depth at each and every point in Switzerland every week once, but we also output at the same time uh, probability, and this probability tells us how much can we trust the snow depth prediction. So how certain is the model that this prediction is true? And this is very um, valuable because you, as a user of a skiing app, yeah, you should understand that any model output comes with a certain probability or uncertainty. Yeah? So you cannot uh, infinitely trust this, which is also true for human experts, of course. Yeah? But one has to understand, and this model has to make transparent, where are the places where we can really trust uh, the model prediction, there's no depth, and where we should rather not trust the model prediction and ask an expert or look for uh, more data that, that should be input to the model. So this is how it looks. So we have this digital elevation model um, of Switzerland, and then we have this uh, Sentinel-1 composite image. So this collects for each and every place in Switzerland the most recent um, information from this synthetic Apache radar, image, and this visualization in greenish is basically visualizing different components of the radar image. So in reality, it does not look green. Uh, it's, it's a grayscale image. It's just to visualize that there's different components, different polarizations, and so on and so on. I don't need to explain in detail. Just trust me that there's a lot of evidence in these images that are very valuable. And then on, on top of this is uh, Sentinel-2, so this optical satellite image mosaic that we stitch together in such a way that we get rid of most of the clouds. So we try to find within that week um, always the pixel that has the least clouds. Uh, we do not always succeed, yeah? so it's not always possible as we know, and if you look at the weather forecast, it doesn't look so great at the moment and for the next week. <laughs> yeah? So and, and in these cases, the SAR imagery is very valuable because then the learning engine can rely on the, on the radar information. Uh, and then what we do is that we output a prediction, and as uh, you might know, so this is a supervised machine learning approach, so we need reference data to train our model, and this reference data comes from our friends at uh, Exolabs, who developed their own uh, approach for snow depth mapping, which is unsupervised, and we also have some very highly accurate reference data from our colleagues and friends at SLF in Davos, who fly um, in, around Davos and all across Switzerland with drones. And I will show you how that looks in a minute. <clears throat> so if we do that, so we, we train our uh, model, our um, deep learning engine. So what we then get as output is a snow depth map for um, each week once. So in snow depth is uh, color coded here, so everything very dark is very low, snow depth close to zero and everything very bright is um, very high snow cover, and we, we kept this basically at four meters snow depth, so that's very deep already. There might be higher ones, but for visualization reasons, we, we kept it here. We can predict higher. Uh, and on the right side, you also see this uncertainty map, which tells us basically how much we can trust, and the darker it is, the more we can trust, and the more light bluish, the less we can trust. And uh, we see that it yeah, slightly or lightly correlates with the snow depth, so the the deeper the snow is, the, the more we're also uncertain. Uh, yes, and this is a comparison. So on the left side, now you see this uh, temporal composite image, this mosaic from the optical satellites. This is how it looks when we look from space at the 10-meter ground sampling distance with the Sentinel-2 in, 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 the, in the Swiss Alps. 
And in the center, you see the state of the art uh, until recently. So this is what used to be um, snow depth maps available as a, as a product uh, in, in Switzerland. And on the right side, you see our new map. And you see that you get much more fine-grained details and a lot more fine-grained structure out in the snow depth. And then, of course, we do a lot of quantitative evaluations. I don't want to bore you with this too much. Uh, but the interesting thing is on the right, so this is this ME, mean error, which tells us a lot about the bias. And would that number be very large, then we would have a bias. So we would basically uh, systematically under or overestimate snow cover depth. And we see here it's around six centimeters, so we are pretty good. Yeah. Okay, it's some more examples. So again, same thing on the left side. It's always the composite of the optical image, a lot of snow in the satellite image. In the center is what was previously state of the art. And on the right side, you see our new map with a lot of fine-grained details and, and texture. And uh, you see that actually out of this, um, you can see a lot of different structures in, in, in the Alps already. You can see that there's different snow depth in different places, and so on and so forth. And this is a comparison now with the reference data from uh, SLF in Davos. So on the top left, you again see this composite from the Sentinel-2 optical image onto the, the mountains. On below it, you see the elevation map, the digital elevation model color-coded. And then um, what you see in the blue box in the top row on the left side, so the B, assigned with B, so this is a reference data collected by drones, by SLF in Davos, and they fly at the same place many times with the drones, and they do photogrammetry, so that they image uh, stitching, structure for motion, and they compare the different uh, digital surface models, and finally they can estimate, or they have very accurate measurements of the snow depth densely. And this is something that we used um, uh, as, as input data to fine-tune our model and then different parts and in different places this, this data to basically validate and this is what we see here. And on the right, um, with uh, again the blue box, the D, this is now our snow depth prediction and in a perfect world this pool should be very much the same as the B with the reference data. Of course it's not, yeah, we have a lot much lower resolution, we have 10 meter ground sampling distance, the UAV has better than 10 centimeters, uh, so it's much, much more information. And then in the bottom you, you will see the residuals, so in the G image, so the th in the bottom row, the second from the right, this is the residuals of what was there before. And if you see the snow depth map of what was state of the art before, so very smooth, messing some texture in ours, you see, is, is better, but we still, of course, have um, some underestimation, overestimation, so everything very red is where we uh, don't uh, um, give the right snow depth, so we underestimate the snow depth, and blue is then the other way around. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so now um, you can actually use this if you have your outdoor active map for ski touring or anything. Yeah, so if you want to do a nice skiing trip in Mürren, and possibly at the, mo at the moment you could possibly do that still, so if you want to go to, to Mürren and you follow this uh, red ski touring track, so the publicly available map on the right side on the top is a one kilometer resolution, you don't see so much. Bottom left is current state of the art, the product that was out there. And then um, this is still very smooth, you don't see the valleys, you don't see a lot of details in the snowpack. And then bottom right is what we can achieve now. And um, there you see a lot more details. Yeah, and so our hope is now, so all the um, uh, yeah, code and everything is, is available. Also, this, this maps are available through ExoLabs, and we publish those. And um, our hope is, of course, that this is now being used at much broader scale, not only in Switzerland, where we know a lot about the snow anyway already, <laughs> but also in different parts of the world where there's still snow, but where there's less technical capabilities. Yeah. And of course, as always with deep learning, generalizability is a question. Uh, so I expect that uh, one will have to collect a little bit of new training data, but then you can basically adapt our model, use some pre-trained model of ours and adapt it to, I don't know, the Himalaya or some parts of Alaska or the Andes or so. Yeah. Okay, so this uh, was the first part. 
Now, uh, let's come to the second part, global vegetation mapping with the JEDA LIDAR and Sentinel-2. So this is uh, the PhD work of Nico Lang, and um, it was uh, funded by the biggest chocolate manufacturer of the world, and that you might actually not know. They are very cal about. They are based in Zurich. They do business-to-business -business chocolate. And they want to get there, or, or already since many years, they want to get palm oil and cocoa supply chains sustainable and deforestation free. And at the same at the time, they asked us if there would be a way to have global high carbon stock maps. Uh, high carbon stock approach, I will so, show you as an application in a few slides, is uh, basically a certified uh, approach to say at some places um, there is still economical agricultural development possible, cocoa, palm oil, you name it, but everything that has high carbon stock, high biomass, high biodiversity or indigenous land rights should be protected. And this was our first step towards this, and there we combine again the Sentinel-2 imagery, so the optical data, now with the very nice, exciting space-borne full wave from LiDAR sensor, and what does this do? So this LiDAR sensor, it's a laser scanner, um, mounted to the payload module of the International Space Station. So there you can see it. It looks down on Earth. It has eight laser beams scanning the Earth. And it's a so-called full waveform thing. So you see there's a, quite some distance uh, across track and also long track, some 60 meter difference between each and every lighter pulse coming down on Earth. And across track also some 50, 60 meters. And the nice thing about this is, this is so-called full waveform LiDAR is there's one laser pulse coming down, but then there's up to a thousand returns of the same pulse being recorded by the instrument. And this enables us now to have a very detailed vertical measure, a very detailed vertical structure of the forest. Yeah? So you get a lot of signal back from the ground, so you see the ground return, yeah? so you get a peak, then you get something in between, and at the top of the canopy, we have a lot of the branches, you get a lot of signal back, and you measure really a full vertical profile through the forest. And from these, um, from this, these beautiful data, you can now measure a lot of different things. And the easiest thing for us to start with was the canopy height, so how high are the trees? Uh, and then there's other things. Yeah? You can also estimate biomass and so on from it, and the distribution of the biomass in the forest and so on. So, and because this is only sparsely distributed, this LiDAR dial, so a point every 50, 60 meters, and then a cross track, so orthogonal to the flying direction, it's a couple hundred meters or tens of meters differences. Uh, we combine this with the Sentinel-2 imagery with a 10 meter grid spacing. Yeah? So we use this as reference data, say we trust this canopy height, and we now basically have a, want a dense 10 meter resolution or grid spacing map um, of forest canopy height of the globe. And um, again, we use um, deep learning comes to our rescue. Yeah? So this is, uh, we have a massive amount of points, um, more than a million um, pulses. And then globally, um, we cut out a lot of satellite images and overlay them with this um, laser scanning pulse. And we train a model and then we densely forward predict globally, such that every 10 meters we estimate the canopy height. And there's multiple different versions of this. Um, the interesting bit is again, so the, the architecture itself for those who have worked with deep learning before is nothing very special, rather a, a standard architecture, some ResNet modules and so on. The interesting thing is again that we do not only measure the, the canopy height, but we also um, um, calibrate our models to output probabilities. Yeah? So we know how high it is and we know how much the model can be trusted. Yeah? And now this is this global map and um, this is a, it's, it's, it's a huge map. So every 10 meters you have a measurement. Yeah? And this is just uh, yeah, three example regions and the left one, um, part A, is the funniest I think. So this is in the state of Oregon, U.S. West Coast, and we discovered this checkerboard pattern, and we thought, okay, something is wrong. You know, we have aliasing in our approach, or we have something uh, fishy, weird going on. And then we looked on Google Maps, and we found this actually exists. 
Yeah? So this is a historical development as reasons. It was when there was this big move west to the uh, U.S. West Coast. This was, in the state of Oregon, the way that the land would be partitioned between state-owned and privately owned. And it was done in a checkerboard pattern, one, by, one mile by one mile patches. And this is what you still see today. Yeah. Yeah, so, and this is now the uncertainty map. Yeah. So for each 10-meter point, we have a prediction of a standard deviation or respective uh, variance. And you also see, so everything very dark has low standard deviation, is more accurate, and everything very bright bluish has high standard deviation. And you also, you already see that close to the letter A, so north of that in Alaska, you have a very high error, basically as high as at the tree depth, yeah, as the tree height. And this stems um, from the reason that this um, reference data that we have, the ISS, does not fly as far north and south as the satellites do. Yeah? So the ISS flies yeah, up to, I would say, up to Hamburg, a bit further than Hamburg north, and that's it. Scandinavia is not covered. So that's outside of our reference data. And the south, it doesn't matter so much. There's a bit of Patagonia, a bit of New Zealand not covered. We don't care so much. But everything, Siberia, Scandinavia, Canada, Alaska is not covered. And this is now correctly predicted by our standard deviation, which basically says, don't trust the results too much. So, and then we had a very smart uh, master student, so Clemence uh, Lanfranchi, and uh, with help from the team from Nikolai and, and Nico, and they said, well, most of the evidence for biomass estimation is in the height of the trees. There's other evidence too, it's not only the height, there's also very wide trees that are low, but a lot of the evidence is in the tree height. So what if we take the canopy height map, we now take biomass reference data, again from the JEDI sensor, and we translate this canopy height to a biomass map. And this is what Clemence did in her master thesis at the 50 meter grid spacing. Now, and um, this is uh, still a preliminary result, and again, she assigned well-calibrated uncertainties to this, and everything, closed, uh, everything dark is, has low uncertainty, everything yellowish, brighter has, has high uncertainty. And you see a very interesting thing here, so if you go towards, if you look um, yeah, um, towards Siberia, so you see a horizontal hazy line of yellow. Uh, and this is exactly what we want to see, because this is the cutoff, this is as far as the Jedi sensor flies. And everything north of that, you still have some forests, then if you go further north, you don't have many forests, more it's too far north, but you would still have forest, but we don't have reference data for it. Uh, so we see that our model, the calibration, works decently. Yeah, so why is this useful? I come back to the original motivation. So this is the um, original motivation that came from uh, yeah, big uh, companies like Barry Carlebaut in our case. So this is this so-called high carbon stock approach, which classifies the landscape into parts of the landscapes that should be protected and those that can still be used for economical development. Uh, and the primary um, source of evidence is carbon stock. So how much carbon can be stored in the vegetation? And then there's, as I said, additional things like indigenous land rights, biodiversity, and so on. And everything dark blue and a bit brighter blue, so open land and scrub, what you see can be developed. And everything greenish up to yellowish should never be touched. Yeah. So now we have this biomass map, and we can now do this classification and say, um, these are the parts that should be protected and others should be not. And what we also did is we also uh, classified palm oil. So this is Southeast Asia. You see uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines mapped. And you see some parts are missing. Yeah? Singapore and Brunei are missing because we had to focus on those <laughs> three countries specifically. But not much palm oil in Singapore. So, um, and what you see is this egg white colored is palm oil. And you see, for example, on Sumatra, there's massive amounts of palm oil everywhere. Yeah. We also mapped coconut, that's more in the Philippines, uh, Palawan, and so on. And we also then added a, an urban layer to see where uh, humans live, where cities are, and so on, which is it's shown in red. So if we zoom in a little bit, so on the left side it's a bit dark, so this is again a Sentinel-2 image, and it's a bit dark, you can't really see it, but you have to trust. So on the, on the right side now we have this intermediate step, the canopy height layer, the yellowish bright, and it's overlaid with a palm oil layer. And now we 
we um, translate this canopy height to the carbon stock on the very right side, and we again have the high carbon stock classes. So everything very dark blue, so OL and S, that's land that can be cultivated, everything else should be not. And uh, the egg white, again, is palm oil. So you see here, for example, that this palm oil, so this egg white areas, which is all palm oil, is, is, is directly neighboring forests and areas that should definitely be protected. Uh, so, and what companies now do is they, they load these maps in, into their uh, sourcing teams and sustainability teams, and they overlay it with the map of the palm oil mills, and they draw a circle around them and say, okay, if we see something like this in a 25-kilometer radius of a palm oil mill, we, we should no longer source from this because there's high risk of uh, deforestation in the supply chain. Yeah. And yeah, this, so, and the other thing is that, so this is the very first publicly available open source map of such kind. And we got a lot of requests from not only from companies, but also from journalists from Indonesia and Malaysia. Because usually before we publish all of this, this was a secret and kept in house with the companies. So this is also a measure, let's say, of transparency. And my hope would be that this is used more and more. Yeah, and keep in mind, it's all open source data, it's open source code, it's everything. So if people want to invest with it, it, it basically comes for free as long as you have a computer and internet access. Okay, so I'm almost at the end. Two more examples. Swiss example. So we also, together with our colleagues from VSL in Birmensdorf, we did this global canopy height, uh, sorry, Swiss wide canopy height mapping for two consecutive years. 2017 and 2018, because there were some severe wind throws and storms in between this Burglind storm. Um, and what we wanted to see is basically, do we actually see this drastic change in canopy height? There's other ways to also measure that, basically, but we just wanted to see, okay, if we have a nation nationwide map of Switzerland of forest height, can we see those changes? And this, um, blue, this uh, black lined, um, polygons, they are the reference data, the ground truth, and the color is encoding whether we are losing a lot of canopy height, which is the more red, so everything very reddish means we lose canopy height, the trees are gone, and you see that this red areas pretty well match um, the reference data that was collected on the ground or by aerial imagery. And um, VSL, so Christian Ginsler's group, is now doing this every year, that there is using our method to have a Swiss-wide uh, canopy height estimate. Of course, if you use uh, airborne laser scanning or aerial photogrammetry, that's much more accurate. Yeah, that, that beats our method by far. But it's also much more expensive. This is why you can only do this every th couple of years in Switzerland. And this is sort of an intermediate product that keeps on a rolling base. It base almost comes for free. And uh, you still get a nice homogeneous overview of, of what's happening in, in Switzerland. So third application, um, moving to uh, now West Africa, cocoa growing regions, we used now our canopy height layer, biomass layer, and um, with the project with the Lind Cocoa Foundation, and again, Barry Kallebaut together, to for the very first time publicly map where cocoa is growing. So all planted cocoa in Ghana and Ivory Coast, which are the biggest um, countries where this is sourced. And... Um, what you see at the bottom is again a satellite image, A and B, and then on the right side to it, um, you basically also see um, the probability map. And I can just tell you, um, so the everything very yellowish is, is high probability of cocoa, and everything dark is low probability of cocoa, and everything dark that you see in those two, A and B, is a protected area. Yeah? It's a natural reserve and we see that there's cocoa growing right, right in, the, in the natural reserve that should be protected. Yeah. So and this is again something based on open publicly available data, open source code. The maps are made publicly available and this is the map has been validated on the ground by our colleagues driving around both countries, validating how accurate it is and this is now the, yeah, the first publicly available highly accurate map of cocoa planted areas. So, then you know um, where deforestation is happening. And it also showed us that countries like Ghana heavily underreport the areas of planted cocoa, so have much more cocoa planted than um, what they report, for example. And, and they also didn't know about this. Yeah. Okay, so this brings me to the end. 
So um, I hope I could convince you that yeah, modern data science is key to progress in many different dimensions. Um, there's a lot of overlap and correlation with my work's team and the SDGs. It's sort of a loose guidance, although we don't overfit to them. There's a lot of hot air also in that, at least in many buzzwords, yeah. But there's a lot of things you can do from a computer science perspective or engineering perspective to support these goals. Um, then I hope I could also convey to you that Earth observation, together with uh, modern deep learning, can provide globally homogeneous actionable insights to decide. Yeah? So if you now go to the Ghanaian government and say, look, you have 40% more cocoa plant than what you know, what does this mean to you? Yeah? Do you need to act or should you protect your areas better? Or also in this uh, Sustainable Commodity Sourcing Act in the European Union and maybe something similar coming at some point in Switzerland too. Um, would you use those maps? Yeah? So maybe this is a good starting point. And uh, one thing that um, I've generally learned in my work, and I'm an engineer, so I studied geomatics engineering, but in my team it's only computer science people at the moment. What I found most valuable is to yeah, uh, work across disciplines. So, of course, fr we have no background in, in biomass or in, or in cocoa or something. So when we start working on this problem, we, we reach out to our friends and colleagues, we try to understand the research questions, what is most important, and then we design and tailor technical approaches together with them. And this takes often a long time, it takes a lot of communication, but it's worth it. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ian, for this very interesting insight. Now it's your turn. Are there any questions? Hi, thanks. Great talk. Um, so when connecting canopy height to biomass, I mean, uh, the biomass is very different for different types of trees, right? And uh, for instance, for the wood density might play a role. How do you account for that? So yeah, if we, if we follow the approach that I showed today, we cannot account for it. So in general, um, what we do is we collect reference data on the ground, right? That basically then accommodates or compensates for that. There's, there's different wood densities. It turns out there, um, there is quite some measurements out there. They are just very hard to get because um, not a lot of this is open source and publicly available. But in Switzerland, we have it through the National Forest Inventory, NFI, for example. Um, so this is what we then do. But it's an issue. Uh, and for many regions in the world, for example, uh, in China, we don't have any samples. We cannot calibrate the model. Also in Latin America, South America, we also have nothing, basically. Yeah. And there's basically, I talked to a lot of colleagues and friends and VSL is doing the same to convince our colleagues at the global scale to share such data that is collected on the ground and to release it. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that's, that's one way to do it. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering on an image uh, on a slide that you were showing the uncertainty and you described Alaska being above this line where the satellite lies. It looked, maybe I'm mistaken, but it looked like uh, Indonesia also had associated high uncertainty. And this yeah. was really within the yeah. satellite. Do yeah. you know what is the reason for that? So first reason is that they are very dense, very high trees. And um, yeah, it's, I believe it, it could also be that the canopy is very, very dense, so that the reference data is sometimes not very trustworthy, that the Jedi LiDAR doesn't penetrate and go all the way to the ground. So this could be one reason. Um, <clears throat> yeah, then for the biomass, um, we didn't have so many samples there. At the time when we worked this, this maps and with the Jedi sensor, that was... We had only data collected for one year or so, so there's not so many samples, and you have to understand that 
the further we go to the equator and the more interesting it gets, the less samples we have uh, due to the orbits. Because the ISS, at the, for orb where the orbits are crossing, so close to Switzerland, northern Germany, we have tons of overlapping points. ISS is passing all the time. But if you go towards the equator, the distance between the different tracks gets wider and wider, so we have less and less points. So, but I hope that once now the, the JEDI sensor is being put back on the ISS now, I think it's already on the ISS or being put in the next month, we can collect much, much more data and then we'll have also much more, much more data close to the equator. But in general, the issue is that the higher the trees are and the higher the biomass are, the less reference data that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talk about so-called long tail distribution. So at the beginning, in the low biomass or low tree height, we have tons of samples. We have uh, many tiny, small trees and a lot low biomass volume. But once we move closer to very high trees and very high biomass, we have less and less reference data. And this is a very, yeah, I would say, bad situation for training deep learning engines because um, you have this global loss function, so you are minimizing a global error across all of the data, and it basically fits to those parts where you have most of the data, because this reduces the error most, which means you always underestimate the high trees and the high biomass. And that's a technical challenge that we have to solve. Not only technical, we also have to collect more reference data, but it's something, um, yeah, training deep learning under this long tail distribution imbalanced data, this is a technical challenge that we tackle in our team. We have a lot of problems like this once you work with real world data, also for biodiversity. And we have biodiversity projects going on and everyone is taking photographs of beautiful flowers, so we have tons of data from that, but no one of, I don't know, worms and, <laughs> and insects, so we have almost no data of those. You have the same. Yeah. Okay, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Concerning the snow depth estimation, you said you use radar data. Um, how is this, uh, uh, or basically with radar data, you can just do a depth map and then make, take the difference? Or am I missing something? Or what is the difficulty in not doing it this way? So, so first, right, so with the radar data in C-band that we have, we don't penetrate deep into the snow. In the end, what we always measure in our case, there's no structure for motion, no explicit 3D measurements. We always basically, the learning engine, the deep learning model, learns to distinguish different patterns on top of the snow from each other. And one speaks for more snow depth and one for the other, right? So you don't actually look deep physically into the snow, right? For this, the snow is often too wet, yeah, it's a microwave, so there's then a current and it goes away. And it's also too, too deep. Yeah? The C-band wavelength is only about six centimeters long, so you don't look very deep. So you only compare um, basically patterns. What you could do, what you might be referring to, so there is 3D possibilities for radar, so so-called interferometry, INSA and so on. And this can be done. It's just that on snow, this is very difficult too. Uh, so it's interferometric synthetic aperture radar or a differential INSA and so on. And um, we are working with techniques like this and for different projects. And it's a way, but it's often very difficult to apply in very mountainous terrain. Uh, but I mean, when there is no snow, I know the distance. And then when there is snow, I can also measure the distance or yeah, exactly. take you the could, difference, right? You could, or? but we don't measure distances. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, we don't measure distances. So this, this radar principle that you have uh, air the most in range, you measure range, you then get amplitude images, but you have um, basically um, in the mountains, you have lots of problems. You cannot imagine it like a laser scanner. A laser scanner would exactly do that, right? You would measure a distance and you can compare, but uh, radar doesn't do that. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a quick question regarding the snow depth project. Um, you said that next to the um, images from the drones that you have uh, as a reference data, you also have uh, exolabs data, and that you mentioned that they use some kind of uh, unsupervised um, method to generate these images. So uh, did I understand correctly that you are using their images that they uh, create as reference data to train your model? and? If so, how exact or how much do you know about their 
uh, algorithm to produce the images. So, so they use a combination of different spectral indices. So they look at the Landsat images, so that's a different family of satellites, or Sentinel-2 optical satellites, and they compute different combinations of uh, colors, so to speak. And then they basically uh, do a regression that fits this estimate to ground station measurements in Switzerland. They have ground reference data point-wise, very sparsely, and they fit that. And then it's, it's a rather coarse model, but because we don't have any other reference data, we basically pre-train our RNN on that data, then we sort of get it smoothing, and then we fine-tune this on this very high-resolution drone data, right? And we, when we put some of that data aside to, as, a, as a test and validation set, right? This is... Hmm. Yeah, do you maybe, uh, as I, uh, at least as I understood it, one of the um, issues is always like the reference data, to get a lot of reference data. Do you have any plans on how to collect it in the future, or do you, do you hope to get more reference data, or is it just like waiting a longer uh, time to, to collect more, or how do you see that? So uh, SLF in Davos is putting a, <coughs> a lot of effort into this, collecting much more um, snow data, snow depth data and anything, other information about avalanches and snow and so on. So, um, <clears throat> so they do this. My, my team, we, we are not doing this. We are also not cryosphere experts at all, right? So we are just the deep learning team or <laughs> machine learning team, I say. And we have to learn from our colleagues at SLF what, uh, what, 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 what are the interesting questions to solve. Um, so if we so we had a request, for example, from colleagues in Alaska, if we could use it, and there they didn't have a lot of reference data, and there we have to tell them, look, you have to come up with something, <laughs> because you um, would have then to fine tune it and adapt our approach to to your environment, because I don't believe it will work out of the box, because in the end we don't do a physical depth measurements; we are correlating depth to some shadow or some structure, some texture, and once you are a different world region that shadow pattern will look different than in Switzerland, for example. So you, you, you have to fine-tune the model and so on. So, but yeah, there is, as far as I know, no global concerted effort in collecting that data. The same like for biomass, there's always a little, little patchy initiatives, and once funding is run, running out, it's stopped, and then some other people continue or not. It's, that's a bit life in, in academia, and I would, yeah, I, would, I would hope that there's a more joint effort to collect such kind of data and make it publicly available. Then. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's one more question at the top. Uh, very cool talk. Uh, so talking about uh, uncertainty, so uh, the uncertainty map there, and uh, does it include the uncertainty of the ground truth data or not? So no. No, there is no, this is just uh, aleatoric uncertainty, right? So there is no uncertainty in the ground truth data. So if we compare to ground measurements, for example, then this is not, not uh, included and has to be model extra. So the worst your reference data is if you compare it, for example, to, I don't know, the, the JEDI reference data, then it's much, it's, it's much, yeah, you should be very careful with trusting the uncertainties. But um, here in this case, um, so for, for the canopy height, then basically the numbers that we provide is uh, validated on true measurements on the ground from aerial laser scanning, and those can be trusted a lot. Uh, and another small question. Uh, so like you talked about the pre-trained model. So if you pre-trained model on the Sentinel-2, can you use this pre-trained model on Landsat, for example, like different um, maybe resolution or actually a bit different spectrum? Yeah. So that's a very good question. You cannot use it right away because Landsat has different bands and a different distribution of the radiometric bands, different spectra. The resolution is different, right? So it's 30 meters nowadays instead of 10 for Sentinel. But I could still imagine that there would be ways to do this. Yeah? So you could use it and fine tune. You could try to fiddle with some of the layers of the network and keep some of the primitive ones intact, but then only fine tune on the top and then that certainly many more sophisticated ways to do, to do this. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So there's another question that came up in the chat. Just a second. So in the chat there's a question, is it possible to recognize avalanches based on the data sets that have been uh, collected for this project? 
And if so, could these patterns also, also be used to predict future ones? So that's a very good question. So the direct answer is we cannot use our snow maps here to predict avalanches because they uh, accumulate over a whole week and so on. And also that the snow depth often is not um, basically so different. But we have a different project that is predicting avalanches from space that I didn't talk about today with um, um, the SLF colleagues, so Elisabeth Hafner, the PhD, working on this and defending in a couple of weeks. And there it's totally possible. Yeah? So satellite images to, to estimate where the avalanches are. She also uses webcam images to look at the avalanches where they are. And this um, is then very useful to understand and, and basically where are most of the avalanches, what kind of avalanches, um, what, what degree of danger comes with them. And if you combine it with a snow depth map, um, you can beautifully um, improve avalanche forecasting, absolutely. Yes. But the, it's, it's, it's Elizabeth's work. I'm just uh, co-supervising there. A lot of cool new deep learning stuff. So I won't, don't want to overclaim or overpromise. So it's... Um, but this is, this is totally possible, and it's being done at SLF. Yeah, great talk, thank you. Uh, what are your biggest challenges with data pre-processing? Like uh, things like off-nadir angle, do you have to correct for reflectances or even spatial distortions from off-nadir? The, the, um, yeah, uh, the shadows, um, clouds, you know, what are, what are the biggest challenges there and the, the most up-to-date solutions? So all of those are challenges. Um, all of those are serious challenges. The good thing is that there's um, basically toolboxes provided by the European Space Agency that solve them to a, a large degree. And since we work at global scale, if there, even if there is some remaining cloud parts in the images, it doesn't confuse our learning engine so much because we use so much data, so it statistically it just gets kicked out. It doesn't enter, let's say, a really an erroneous signal into the learning engine. What is the biggest challenge, I would say, is first like the sheer quantity of data. Yeah, so you have to imagine one 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer Sentinel-2 tile is 1.4 gigabyte. Yeah? And then you have thousands of those, even more for one map. So the only way we could actually produce, or Nico could produce, the canopy height map at the time, was that he had to stream the data from AWS, the Amazon cloud, because that was all pre-processed. He was forward predicting the map, and he was erasing the data again. And this is all through the ETH Euler cluster, Euler cluster, which is high performance already, because it would have been just way too much data. We could not have handled it. So I think the sheer size of the data is an issue which is why there's a lot of promise nowadays in foundational models and so on. So deep learning approach is to compress tons of the satellite, satellite data into um, much smaller um, representations that then can be used at, uh, with lighter devices. So then, then for radar, it's a bit different. So radar is also a sheer size, but there we are battling, and it's always like this, with the typical synthetic aperture radar effects. Yeah? So the radar sensor has sort of this um, side-looking geometry. So you have a lot of what is called layover foreshorten foreshortening and shadowing. Yeah? Because it doesn't look top-down like the optical satellite, but from the side, um, if there's a mountain ridge that is sort of parallel to the orbit of the satellite, you only see one side of the mountain, the other one is in the shadow. You don't see anything. Yeah? And then also the whole mountain side, the flank, is reduced onto one line because it's measuring only range. So then if this is a 90 degree angle, everything is reduced to only one line. So this is a serious issue that's very well known. It's radar geometry, but this is uh, often very hard to deal with. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. A uh, very quick question about the optical inputs in your snow depth model. So to the best of my knowledge, some people have developed some indices that you can calculate based on different channels. So do you use those in your models as well, or do you trust your model that it's smart enough if you just dump all the data in there that it can learn also from all the data what to do? So we don't use them. 
It's used for this sort of soft reference data by Exolabs. They use exactly these indices. Uh, we don't use it because, well, it's sort of a bit the computer science approach to do these things end-to-end -end and work with the rawest possible data. But I do think um, using them would actually be smart because what we have seen in many approaches is that there is this deep learning paradigm to start with the raw data, but then a lot of the capacity of the model, a lot of the training at the beginning is wasted to sort of then learn all the indices and all the knowledge that we would know anyway, right? So I think it would be a very good idea to just also enter them, use them. So we didn't do it. We wanted a beautiful machine learning paper out, elegant, clean, yeah, no compromises, but for practical uh, use cases, I would definitely use them. Yeah, yeah there's another question in the chat. Ah, OK. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, how far back could you go with that data? One, when, yeah, that's the one question. And you talked about the sheer mass of data and your wishes for closer collaboration to access those data and how to handle those sheer mass of data. What would be your, your vision for, for long-term access to those data? Yeah, I mean, the long, so the first question was how long can you go back? So the, the uh, largest available, like, civil satellite archive is the Landsat archive, so we can go back 40 years and look at this, which doesn't mean that we can apply our deep learning model 40 years back because the satellite design changed slightly over time, but it would be a super exciting research project to try doing that. Yeah? So because you have usually overlap between... I don't know, Landsat 7, Landsat 8, Landsat 9. So you have two images. So you could sort of try to incrementally try to go back in time and see, for example, for palm oil, who illegally deforested what. I mean, you don't know who, but when something got deforested at what time where, right? So this, this can be done in theory. It would be an amazing research project. I proposed this once, but we got rejected. So this is life uh, in science. But... <laughs> Uh, it's certainly interesting. Um, you have many more images um, that can still be used that go further back. There's this corona uh, satellite images from CIA, so spy satellite images covering the whole Soviet Union and so on, um, that are available. And there's a lot of colleagues working with those that look back, okay, how was Siberia looking at the time when permafrost was still fully there and so on and so on, right? There's also um, images I've worked with colleagues um, from un University de uh, Libre in Brussel um, that uh, closely work together with colleagues in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And there we still have from the colonial times, from the Belgian army, we have aerial black and white imagery. And we can see um, how settlements were at the time, uh, where vegetation was and so on. And, and together with, um, with my colleagues there, we did some project to see can we automatically classify how in the Congo region looked at the time in the 50s, 40s, and so on. Yeah. So then how to handle this? Yeah, I, 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 I don't have this sort of yeah, golden bullet yeah, or silver bullet. Um, the best case would be to have basically a, a joint archive of images um, publicly accessible somewhere in the cloud, but then we would also need to have compute in the cloud, and that doesn't come for free, which is why... Um, I was hoping, for example, the European Space Agency, they have this data, but they actually started restricting access more and more. And I read between the lines, it was more due to political reasons and um, also because ESA is tasked to only develop the hardware, the satellites, right? But then the data distribution, everything should be done by private companies in, in, in the European Union, in Switzerland, and so on, which then turns out to be solutions that are costly and we have to pay for them and then we end up not being able to use this efficiently. So my dream would be that we have a European concerted effort, put everything in the cloud, make everything publicly available unless there's ethical reasons not to do so. Yeah. That would be my hope. Provide everyone with data access, provide everyone with a certain computational budget to directly work in the cloud. So that would be my vision. <laughs> yeah. Costly though. <laughs> and another question from the chat um, what do you think are the current challenges for deep learning methods to solve various remote sensing tasks so 
I must say the biggest challenges in deep learning is not the methods themselves, but the data pre-processing, the data download, the data engineering, which is sometimes very frustrating, especially for the PhDs and postdocs, because they have to spend so much time on the data massaging and have so little time on the cool new technology and have to wait for ages until something drains. So, um, but from the deep learning side, I mean something cool new, like diffusion models, nerves, all the generative uh, beauty that is out there, transformers, diffusion models, for example, to model biodiversity. Yeah. So we are working on this in my team. The generative approaches have a lot of wealth and richness, and I believe we can, for example, model species distribution, species distribution models, so to, to say what plants and animals are where at what time at the globe much better with those models. So we, we haven't been successful so far, but I think there's great promise to do so. Yeah, to step away from so-called discriminative methods that only model the output distribution, basically, to fully generative models that jointly model the reference data and, and the input data. And, and those are beautiful models. And we see this now in the chat GPT has a lot of this included and so on. But I think there's even much more promise if we would start using them. And we do, but <laughs> we still have to wait until we get some good results. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Um, before we guide you to the upper row, we have like a special program point, so... Yeah, perhaps we first thank... Uh, <laughs> for, we thank again for this nice presentation.